This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Essays of Francis Bacon. Essay 37 Of Masks and Triumphs. These things are but toys to come against such serious observations. But yet, since princes will have such things, it is better they should be graced with elegancy than daubed with cost. Dancing to song is a thing of great state and pleasure. I understand it that the song be in choir, placed aloft, and accompanied with some broken music, and the ditty fitted to the device. Acting in song, especially in dialogues, hath an extreme good grace. I say acting, not dancing, for that is a mean and vulgar thing. And the voices of the dialogue would be strong and manly, a bass and a tenor, no treble. And the ditty high and tragical, not nice or dainty. Several choirs, placed one over against another, and taking the voice by catches, anthem-wise, give great pleasure. Turning dances into figure is a childish curiosity, and generally let it be noted that those things which I here set down are such as do naturally take the sense, and not respect petty wonderments. It is true the alterations of scenes, so it be quietly and without noise, are things of great beauty and pleasure, for they feed and relieve the eye, before it be full of the same object. Let the scenes abound with light, specially colored and varied, and let the maskers, or any other that are come down from the scene, have some motions upon the scene itself, before their coming down. For it draws the eye strangely, and makes it with great pleasure to desire to see, that it cannot perfectly discern. Let the songs be loud and cheerful, and not chirpings or pulings. Let the music likewise be sharp and loud and well placed. The colors that show best by candlelight are white, carnation, and a kind of sea water green. And o's or spangs, as they are of no great cost, so they are of most glory. As for rich embroidery, it is lost and not discerned. Let the suits of the maskers be graceful and such as become the person when the visors are off. Not after examples of known attires, Turk, soldiers, mariners, and the like. Let anti-masks not be long. They have been commonly of fools, satyrs, baboons, wild men, antics, beasts, sprites, witches, Ethiopes, pygmies, turquettes, nymphs, rustics, cupids, statuas moving, and the like. As for angels, it is not comical enough to put them in anti-masks, and anything that is hideous as devils, giants, is on the other side as unfit. But chiefly let the music of them be recreative, and with some strange changes, some sweet odors suddenly coming forth, without any drops falling, are in such a company as there is steam and heat things of great pleasure and refreshment. Double masks, one of men, another of ladies, addeth state and variety. But all is nothing except the room be kept clear and neat. For justs and tourneys and barriers, the glories of them are chiefly in the chariots, wherein the challengers make their entry, especially if they be drawn with strange beasts, as lions, bears, camels, and the like or in the devices of their entrance, or in the bravery of their liveries, or in the goodly furniture of their horses and armor. But enough of these toys. Essay 38 Of Nature in Men Nature is often hidden, sometimes overcome, seldom extinguished. Force maketh nature more violent in the return, doctrine and discourse maketh nature less importune, but custom only doth alter and subdue nature. He that seeketh victory over his nature, 
let him not set himself too great nor too small tasks. For the first will make him dejected by often failings, and the second will make him a small proceeder, though by often prevailings. And at the first let him practice with helps, as swimmers do with bladders or rushes. But after a time let him practice with disadvantages, as dancers do with thick shoes. For it breeds great perfection, if the practice be harder than the use. Where nature is mighty, and therefore the victory hard, the degrees had need be first to stay and arrest nature in time, like to him that would say over the four and twenty letters when he was angry, then to go less in quantity, as if one should in forbearing wine come from drinking healths to a draught at a meal, and lastly to discontinue altogether. But if a man have the fortitude and resolution to enfranchise himself at once, that is the best. Optimus, illi, animi, vindex, laedentia, pectus, vincula qui rupit, dedoluitque semel. Neither is the ancient rule amiss to bend nature as a wand to a contrary extreme whereby to set it right, understanding it where the contrary extreme is no vice. Let not a man force a habit upon himself with a perpetual continuance, but with some intermission. For both the pause reinforceth the new onset, and if a man that is not perfect be ever in practice, he shall as well practice his errors as his abilities, and adduce one habit of both. And there is no means to help this, but by seasonable intermissions. But let not a man trust his victory over his nature too far, for nature will lay buried a great time, and yet revive upon the occasion or temptation. Like as it was with Aesop's damsel, turned from a cat to a woman, who sat very demurely at the board's end, till a mouse ran before her. Therefore let a man either avoid the occasion altogether, or put himself often to it, that he may be little moved with it. A man's nature is best perceived in privateness, for there is no affectation, and passion, for that putteth a man out of his precepts, and in a new case or experiment, for there custom leaveth him. They are happy men whose natures sort with their vocations, otherwise they may say, multum in cola fuit anima mia. When they converse in those things, they do not affect. In studies, whatsoever a man commandeth upon himself, let him set hours for it. But whatsoever is agreeable to his nature, let him take no care for any set times, for his thoughts will fly to it of themselves. So as the spaces of other business or studies will suffice. A man's nature runs either to herbs or weeds. Therefore let him seasonably water the one, and destroy the other. Essay 39 of custom and education. Men's thoughts are much according to their inclination, their discourse and speeches according to their learning and infused opinions, but their deeds are after as they have been accustomed. And therefore, as Machiavel well noteth, though in an evil-favored instance, there is no trusting to the force of nature, nor to the bravery of words, except it be corroborate by custom. His instance is, that for the achieving of a desperate conspiracy, a man should not rest upon the fierceness of any man's nature, or his resolute undertakings, but take such an one as hath had his hands formerly in blood. But Machiavel knew not of Friar Clement, nor a Raviac, nor a Jargai, nor a Balthazar Garard. Yet his rule holdeth still, that nature, nor the engagement of words, are not so forcible as custom. Only superstition is now so well advanced, that men of the first blood are as firm as butchers by occupation, and votary resolution is made equivalent to custom, even in matter of blood. In other things, the predominancy of custom is everywhere visible, insomuch as a man would wonder to hear men profess, protest, engage, give great words, and then do just as they had done before, as if they were dead images and engines moved only by the wheels of custom. We see also the reign or tyranny of custom, what it is, 
The Indians, I mean the sect of their wise men, lay themselves quietly upon a stock of wood, and so sacrifice themselves by fire. Nay, the wives strive to be burned with the corpses of their husbands. The lads of Sparta, of ancient time, were wont to be scourged upon the altar of Diana, without so much as quetching. I remember in the beginning of Queen Elizabeth's time of England, an Irish rebel condemned, put up a petition to the deputy, that he might be hanged in a with, and not in an halter, because it had been so used with former rebels. There be monks in Russia, for penance, that will sit a whole night in a vessel of water, till they be engaged with hard ice. Many examples may be put of the force of custom, both upon mind and body. Therefore, since custom is the principal magistrate of man's life, let men by all means endeavor to obtain good customs. Certainly custom is most perfect when it beginneth in young years. This we call education, which is, in effect, but an early custom. So we see in languages, the tongue is more pliant to all expressions and sounds, the joints are more supple to all feats of activity and motions, in youth than afterwards. For it is true that late learners cannot so well take the ply, except it be in some minds that have not suffered themselves to fix, but have kept themselves open and prepared to receive continual amendment, which is exceeding rare. But if the force of custom simple and separate be great, the force of custom copulate and conjoined and collegiate is far greater. For their example teacheth, company comforteth, emulation quickeneth, glory raiseth. So as in such places the force of custom is in his exaltation. Certainly the great multiplication of virtues upon human nature resteth upon societies well ordained and disciplined. For commonwealths and good governments do nourish virtue grown, but do not much mend the deeds. But the misery is, that the most effectual means are now applied to the ends least to be desired. Essay 40. Of Fortune. It cannot be denied, but outward accidents conduce much to fortune. Favor, opportunity, death of others, occasion fitting virtue. But chiefly the mold of a man's fortune is in his own hands. Faber quisque fortunei suei, saith the poet. And the most frequent of external causes is, that the folly of one man is the fortune of another. For no man prospers so suddenly as by others' errors. Serpens nisi serpentum comaderet non fit draco. Overt and apparent virtues bring forth praise, but there be secret and hidden virtues that bring forth fortune certain deliveries of a man's self which have no name. The Spanish name, Desimboltura, partly expresseth them, when there be not stons nor restiveness in a man's nature, but that the wheels of his mind keep way with the wheels of his fortune. For so Livy, after he had described Cato Major in these words, in illo viro tantum robur corporis et animi fuit ut quoquenque loco natus esset fortunam sibi facturas videretur falleth upon that that he had versatile ingenium therefore if any man look sharply and attentively he shall see fortune for though she be blind yet she is not invisible the way of fortune is like the milken way in the sky, which is a meeting or not of a number of small stars, not seen asunder, but giving light together. So are there a number of little and scarce discerned virtues, or rather faculties and customs, that make men fortunate. The Italians note some of them, such as a man would little think. When they speak of one that cannot do amiss, they will throw in into his other conditions that he hath poco di matto. And certainly there be not two more fortunate properties than to have a little of the fool and not too much of the honest. Therefore extreme lovers of their country or masters were never fortunate, neither can they be. 
For when a man placeth his thoughts without himself, he goeth not his own way. And hasty fortune maketh an enterpriser and remover. The French hath it better, entreprenant or remuant. But the exercised fortune maketh the able man. Fortune is to be honored and respected, and it be but for her daughter's confidence and reputation. For those two felicity breedeth, the first within a man's self, the latter in others towards him. All wise men, to decline the envy of their own virtues, used to ascribe them to providence and fortune. For so they may the better assume them. And besides, it is greatness in a man to be the care of the higher powers. So Caesar said to the pilot in the tempest, Caesarum portus, et fortunam aegis. So Scylla chose the name of Felix, and not of Magnus. And it hath been noted, that those who ascribe openly too much to their own wisdom and policy, end in fortunate. It is written that Timotheus the Athenian, after he had in the account he gave to the state of his government, often interlaced this speech, and in this, fortune had no part, never prospered in anything he undertook afterwards. Certainly there be, whose fortunes are like Homer's verses, that have a slide and easiness more than the verses of other poets. As Plutarch saith of Timoleon's fortune, in respect of that of Agesilius or Epaminondas, and that this should be, no doubt it is much, in a man's self. End of The Essays of Francis Bacon Essays 37, 38, 39, and 40.